Okay, before I forget, let me say that uh, I, w I won't be able to have office hours this afternoon as usual this week. Um, so if, if you want to talk about anything uh, before next Wednesday, just send me a mail and um, we can fix the time to meet. Okay? Uh, but I will not be able to have office hours at 3.30 this afternoon. Um, okay, so today we're looking again at Dritschke. This is a little bit echoey. Is this a little bit echoey? It's fine? Okay. Um, and uh, actually, many of the questions that um, uh, I want to look at for Dretschke today were raised by you guys last time. And I tried to fob you off then, but um, today we'll, we'll try and look at them a bit more fully, uh, uh, those questions. Um, and then on uh, Friday, we'll look at Fodor's uh, meaning in the world order. Um, okay. The, Dretschke's uh, uh, stuff about the analysis of mental representation is part of a much bigger project that he has, and it's, it's one that's shared by quite a lot of people. Um, he puts it like this, all mental facts are representational facts, and all representational facts about facts are facts about informational functions. They're facts that, that you can explain the notion of representation that's needed in terms of... Uh, uh, indication and function in the way we were looking at last time. Yeah, so that is really a, a global appro uh, 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 approach there, right? So all the facts about our conscious life, the whole mind-body problem, facts about conscious experience, are all going to be explained in terms of representation, and then grounded out in talk about uh, the function of neural systems being to indicate this or that. Okay, you see that's a pretty global program, that's a pretty ambitious program. Um, and uh, notice that if he's right, then what I've been saying about the role of consciousness and acquaintance with the world must be completely wrong. Uh, I mean, these are really head-on opposed views. So I was saying, if you follow Russell and say, there's such a thing as being acquainted with aspects of the world around you, um, and that acquaintance with the quality of aspects of the world around you. That's not itself something representational. Yeah, that, that's what makes it possible for you to think about the colors or the people. You're conscious of the colors and the people and the shapes and so on. And that's what makes it possible for you to think about them. Right, that's very intuitive. <laughs> yes, that's very intuitive. But, uh, well, that's what Russell thought. I mean, what more do you want? Um, um, but Andretzky's approach, that gets things around the wrong way. You don't explain facts about representation or the ability to think about things in terms of you're being conscious of objects and properties. It's around the other way. What is it to be aware of the objects and properties around you? Well, that's a matter of representing them, of mentally representing them. And that, in turn, is to be explained in terms of being in states whose function is to indicate the presence of those objects and properties. So uh, th th there really is a, a, a head-on clash between these two ways of thinking about the relation between meaning and consciousness. <laughs> yep. Put up your hand if that makes perfect sense. <laughs> There's a large number of small hands. <laughs> okay. It makes kind of sense. Yeah. Uh, well, um, look at the Russell approach. Meaning is explained in terms of right. That's the fundamental thing. That's the one. You, as you can see, is down at the bottom, right? Yeah, and you explain meaning in terms of it. Yeah, that's all right. Whereas on a Dretschka approach, uh, conscious acquaintance is explained in terms of meaning or representation, as he usually puts it. And that's explained in terms of functions to indicate. So now do you see, right, they're completely around the other way. On this one, meaning is at the bottom. On this one, meaning is at the top. 
What could be more fundamentally opposed than that? Any questions about that? Okay, I'll try to come back to that a little bit later. Um, um, whatever you think about that, uh, uh, the whole approach we've had so far is to talk, to talk as if <coughs> the existence of standards of truth and falsity for representations can be explained in terms of causal connections between the representational system and the world. And what Dretschke is doing is really elaborating that. And I think that one simple reason why this is an important account is that whether or not this kind of global thing about the relation between consciousness and representation is correct, whether or not Dretschke is right about that, this is certainly, I think, the notion of information the scientists use when they're talking about brain processing. Um, if you think about uh, scientists wondering what's going on in a particular visual system, for example, they're looking at what these neurons are doing. Right? That's what scientists are trying to figure out when they look at a bit of your visual brain. They say, what, why are these neurons firing? And what they look at is what stuff out there on the computer screen, when I've got the subject here looking at a computer screen, and I've got them all wired up to an image or, or, or electrodes or whatever it is, then um, what is it on the screen that makes those neurons fire? Right, so you look for causal correlations between what's out on the screen and when the neurons fire. And you also want it to be plausible that neuro those neurons are for picking up that kind of phenomenon on the screen. It's not that this is just some random thing which, by some freak of nature, happens to make those neurons fire. You want it to be that what good those neurons do the person, what they're for, is for responding to edges or responding to shapes or responding to movement. So you find that the neurons are responding to movement. They're firing when you get movement. And then you say, uh, and that's likely what they're for. That's why you, we've, got, we've got those neurons in the first place. Yeah. So I think that's just a description, really, of how scientists think about information processing in the brain. And then you can put this larger question about uh, M m uh, the mind generally and those representational facts as a question about what is consciousness, what is the kind of meaning we have in language have to do with the information that scientists, information processing that scientists describe as going on in the brain. And Dretschke's picture is you can just reduce one to the other. The scientific notion of information processing, that's all you need to understand all the other phenomena uh, of, of meaning in mind. Um, whereas this approach that says you've got to explain meaning in terms of consciousness is saying, no, there really is something important left out of that, or kind of the, the kind of contact we have with the world in everyday life, the sensory experience we have. That grounds uh, linguistic meaning in a way that the mere brain stuff doesn't. Okay? Plain as day? Okay. And the basic problem here for uh, Dretschke is one that someone raised last time. Um, we're going to explain right and wrong for representations in terms of causal connections between the representational system and the world. And then the puzzle is, how can the mere existence of causal connections be giving you standards of right and wrong? I mean, things cause each other the whole time. Imagine, picture if you will, um, an avalanche in a mountain, right? The, a boulder bounces off a bit of a mountain, sets off an avalanche. Then um, there you have causation. Do you have right or wrong? Class, do you have right or wrong if a boulder sets off an avalanche? No, you do not. I mean, mere cause and effect doesn't mean that there's right and wrong. If bits of the world cause your brain to go into different states, that mere causal connection doesn't constitute the existence of standards of right or wrong. Yep. So the notion of function is doing a lot of work here. The notion of function is doing something to explain how right and wrong get into the picture in the first place. Um, there isn't anything. I mean, it's not the function of the boulder to produce an avalanche. 
or to not produce an avalanche, if you see what I mean. That's why we don't talk about right and wrong here. Um, but the idea is that with the brain or with the mind, the kind of causation we've got involves bits of the human that do have functions. The two key notions, as I said, are the idea of one thing indicating another, maybe because this other thing is what causes this thing. So um, a ringtone indicates someone trying to call you, <laughs> right? <laughs> because that's what, it, that, that's what usually causes it, right? Just to take an example at random. Um, uh, and it's the function of that thing uh, to, uh, to, to indicate in that way. Yep. Plain as day? Yeah. Um, so if you take uh, the speedometer in the car, um, the speedometer being at uh, 50 mph indicates this, you're going at 50 mph, because if it is going, if you are going, if the speedometer is at 50 mph, uh, then um, you're going at 50 mph because your speed is what's causing the position of the needle. Yeah? Smoke indicates fire, uh, because if there's smoke, then there's fire, because fire is what usually causes smoke. And as people were saying last time, it doesn't have to be every single time. It's just often enough, that's what's going on. Um, OK, so when you have assigned the functions, as you have for a speedometer, um, somebody made it for this purpose, then that certainly involves standards of right and wrong. Yeah. If you make a ringtone so that it will indicate um, uh, someone calling you, then if, if it just goes off at random when there's no one calling you, then that is a problem. <laughs> it shouldn't be doing that. You can talk about right or wrong here. But the idea is that functions that you observe in the context of evolutionary theory, when you talk about the evolutionary function of something, the reason it exists is that it does this or that. The reason it exists is that um, it, it's causally sensitive to the presence of edges in your visual field. Then uh, uh, that, the, the, that's where standards of right and wrong come from. Two, that evolutionary functions can bring with them right and wrong. So there is a question how it's going to be possible for there to be such a thing as error here. But in a way, that's a good thing. Um, Putnam, for example, would argue, because by and large, we're going to be getting it right about our environment. Yeah? Uh, we'll be do, uh, 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 if our systems are functioning the way evolution designed them, then uh, we are, by and large, going to be getting it right about the world around us. OK, so that's just to whistle over um, Gretzky, uh, the schematics of Gretzky's picture. All happy with that? Are we, are we comfortable with that? Yeah? Does it seem right, Tresh's picture? After all, I've tried to tell you about consciousness. <laughs> or does it seem a natural but naive mistake? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Sorry, can, can you say it out loud? The evolutionary thing, yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with the evolutionary thing? Don't, don't things have evolutionary functions? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I, 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 it's not that I, I don't understand what you're saying. I can't quite hear it. Uh, OK, you don't want to go over that again. OK, OK. You can go over that again if you like. I like going over things again. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, magnetosomes, right? Magnetosomes for the bacteria that need oxygen-free water. This is um, a couple of zoologists in, I think it's Norway, looking for magnetosomes. Um, don't say you don't learn anything in this class. Um, <laughs> Sorry? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and there the thing is, there's the magnetosome. OK, so the magnetosome Pointing straight ahead means that uh, oxygen-free water is straight ahead. The function of the magnetosome is to indicate um, the direction of the oxygen-free water. It does that because it indicates where the oxygen-free water is. Uh, when, it's, when it's pointing straight ahead, the oxygen-free water is straight ahead. Yep. 
And even from an evolutionary point of view, the magnetosome has the function of indicating the direction of oxygen-free water. Yeah, that's all right. So if you lure the thing to its death, um, then you then it made a misrepresentation. Yeah, so we've got standards of right and wrong. Well, what more do you want, right? Well, there's always something. Um, the thing is, whenever something causes the system to go into that state, um, and people raised this last time, um, if you hold the magnet and the magnetosome points towards the magnet, then you can say, well, the function of the magnetosome is to point towards local magnetic north. Yeah. So actually, the magnetosome was getting it right. It didn't make a mistake. Um, what happens is that there's usually a correlation between local magnetic north, geomagnetic north, I mean the North Pole, and, um, and oxygen-free water. And usually what's going on is that the, magnetic, the bacterium exploits that correlation. So if you're using a compass, you're using something whose function is to point to a geomagnetic north. And um, uh, you use that to get you to what, a pub or something, and um, uh, it gets you to your destination, but not by, because it directly indicates that destination. Yep. So if the organism has a need for G, it can get G by having a subsystem whose function is to indicate G directly, or there can be something else that's usually correlated with G, um, and then in its actions, the, the function is to indicate that thing that's usually correlated with the goal, and then the organism is just relying on that correlation. Yeah? So if you follow that line of thought, um, it seems like it's going to be very hard to get misrepresentations. Because if anything causes the system to fire, you can say, yes, function is to respond to that cause. When you use the uh, bar magnet, it will just correctly representing the direction of local magnetic north. There's no breakdown in representation here. The only problem is that uh, that correlation broke down, and it usually relies on that correlation. But it doesn't represent that correlation. It just uses it in action. So earlier, we spent uh, quite a while in the class talking about um, what, you can th what are sometimes called horizontal problems about defining the causal chain, so that if a uh, if you say, I'm talking about that projector because uh, that's the one that's causally impacting me, then how come the, uh, I'm not equally talking about the sun or uh, the walls that the light is bouncing off? These are also causally involved in producing my perception. So how can you single out just one of the many causes of your perception as the one that you're talking about? Um, and on the other hand, what we're talking about here are kind of vertical problems in causation because there is a kind of distant causal, uh, there is a causal chain between me and the projector. And there are many states, uh, you might say, look, what you're causally responding to after all is not the projector, but the pattern of hits in your retina. What you're talking about is your retinal stimulation. There's usually a correlation between your retinal stimulation and whether there's a projector out there. Sometimes that can break down. But all you ever need to represent is the pattern of hits in your retina. You see what I mean? That's a different kind of, feels like a different kind of problem to uh, the first kind of problem. Yeah? So why would it be right to say in a causal theory that you're not always just talking about the pattern of hits in your retina? Maybe that is all you've ever been talking about the whole time. I mean, it's what you're causally responsive to, what gets you talking. You just dis uh, described, you, you just respond differentially to different patterns of hits in your retina. Well, maybe this is a discovery, not a problem. Uh, this is what are we going to do? What? <laughs> What's Gretchen going to do?
Well, maybe you should just pack it up there. <laughs> yes? Didn't, uh, didn't you say that uh, if people assign the functions? People assign the functions, yeah. Uh, well, you, you assi people assign functions to things like speedometers or weighing scales, uh, for, for example, yeah. Um, but evolution is what's supposed to be giving the function to the bit of your brain. Right, it's up to you to do that. Yeah, and, and then you can just compare, you can just compare across in terms of what's interesting. Yeah, but uh, if you say it's assigned functions, I mean, I agree it's always tempting to say that. It's assigned functions, even in the case of humans, and not, uh, not just weighing scales and speedometers and so on. Yeah. Um, but the basic problem there is that you need some intentions or representations to assign the functions. Yeah. Um, and then that's was Dretschke's thing. It's, this talk is tinted with the intentionality of the purposes or, fun or uh, uh, intentions that you are uh, using to assign the function. Yeah, uh, and th th that just goes back to the basic problem here that um, you can get a system of representation going very straightforwardly if you already have a system of representation. The pro problem is, where does representation come from in the first place? Yeah? And what we're trying to do is describe representation here in terms of the kind of causal responsiveness the brain has to the environment. Yeah? That's the source of representation in right and wrong. And we're not going to presume anything about what we want or what we'd like, because that all is representational. Yeah? We're describing how there can be a mind in the first place not what the mind can do once it's up and running. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, yes? Um, but doesn't he say there's that cycle about embodiment? Embodiment, embodiment yep. Right, so just like in that way you're thinking like anything that you see or you're perceiving, you are perceiving it as, you know, do I want to act upon my environment? Yeah. So isn't that the way our mind Yes. Yeah, I think that's very important, right? That um, it's not that you're looking at the brain system in isolation. You're looking at it as in a body, in an environment, and thinking what the function of the brain system is in that body, what it's doing in the whole system, in the, in the whole thing, in the context of the whole thing. That's where I talk about function comes in. Um, but the trouble we have here is that. Uh, the idea would be, you, you, your idea would be, and I did try to put it l like that last time, that there are all these different causal chains impacting you at any one time. Which ones are the ones that are important for representation? Well, the ones that are defined in terms of function. But the thing I just walked through about the magnetosome is that that's not enough to pin down just what the magnetosome is representing. That because um, you could describe its function for the whole bacterium. I mean, the bacterium is embodied, if you see what I mean. You get this thing about embodiment even with the bacterium, that um, you can describe the function of the magnetosome in the bacterium as being to indicate local magnetic north or geomagnetic north or where the oxygen-free water is. And you st we, we, need, we need to get a way of pinning down which one is the relevant, uh, gives us the relevant way of describing the function. Yeah. You have just too many causal connections here. And we've got to get, be able to fix in one unique one if we're going to be able to talk about any determinate content at all. Uh, one, two. Whichever is most, co most correlated with the goal. Yeah.
Yeah, the, that's really not a bad idea. But if you think about the example I gave of the compass, you know, if you're using a compass to get you to a particular destination, yeah, then um, what you're using the compass for, uh, 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 the compass is just representing where geomagnetic north is. Yeah? And that doesn't seem a matter of what it's correlated with exactly. Um, your goal is not to get to geomagnetic north. Your goal might just be to get home. But it's still, so it's not, rep maybe, actually, perhaps I'm misunderstanding what you say. There are two different things you said. One is what is most correlated with. The other is what the goal is. Yeah? I guess, that, I guess my point about the compass is these can come apart. What the compass is most highly correlated with is geomagnetic north. But it's relatively few people who are actually using a compass to get to geomagnetic north, if, if you see what I mean, yeah, um, you know, polar explorers and all that. But um, around the planet, people are using compasses every day, and they're just trying to get home or just trying to figure out the way to campus or something, yeah. Uh, so I don't think you can equate what is most correlated with, with what the goal of the thing is, yeah. Uh, sorry, you had a question. You forgot. <laughs> right. Yes? So it seems like the thing I've noticed when we should be trying to do two things, like there's sort of two intuitions. One is like, well, surely it must be representing either oxygenated or deoxygenated water, whichever one is sort of red. Yeah, deoxygenated um, is good for it. Yeah, it doesn't so like oxygen. It's representing deoxygenated water because that's what's important for it to like right. survive. That's right. Or maybe it's representing local magnetic north. Yeah, so it's like it, there's too many candidates for what too it's many candidates. And we want yeah. to get this sort of intuitively right one. Yeah. But then it seems like you could also just be skeptical and think, well, maybe we shouldn't be trying to get the right one anyway because maybe this isn't really a Maybe there is no right one, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I mean, it's only a humble bacterium. I mean, well, why should we think that the, um, the noble achievements of the human mind could be properly modeled by a mere bacterium? Yep. Yeah, I mean, even if we do get, even if we do come up with a theory that gets the intuitively right answer to the magnetosome, yeah. it might not have anything to do, to do with us. Yeah. I think actually Dretschke thinks that. Um, I mean, I, I don't think he thinks that you've got to go far beyond the magnetosome, but I think, I think he thinks it's got to be a bit, <laughs> it's got to be a bit better than the magnetosome to, to uh, model us. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's the puzzle. Right the way I've been stating it, what exactly does the magnetosome represent? Oxygen-free water, uh, geomagnetic north, or local magnetic north? Yep. That's okay. That, that makes perfect sense at this point. Yep. Um, so how do we narrow it down? Well, Dresge's idea is, suppose the magnetosome had two different ways of finding the direction of oxygen-free water. So uh, suppose that light will give it away. I mean, the pre uh, wh wh where the light is. I mean, maybe the oxygen-free water is down, is deep down. Is when you get towards. That sounds quite plausible, doesn't it? Yeah, I bet that's right. Uh, it's when you get to the top that you get lots of oxygen in the water, and when you go down, you don't get too much oxygen. So um, suppose it has a single structure, and uh, when the ma uh, when the magnet points in a particular direction, um, that fires that structure, or a light detector can fire that structure. Yeah, that makes it more plausible that this is, it's just trying to get onto the direction of oxygen-free water any way it can. Yeah, if it's got two ways of finding out. Um, so it couldn't then be, it couldn't be that the structure is just indicating the local magnetic north or just indicating the direction of light. Yeah, um, so this is the situation here. You got the structure, and it, w w the top one, let's suppose, is the, mag is the magnet pointing towards uh, geomagnetic north. The uh, second structure, uh, the, the second thing that fires off this S is um, light, and uh, then it will move in the direction indicated in response to either pathway. Yeah, and that, that's. The idea is you might try. That's what makes you say it's trying to get away from oxygenated water. Yep, there are two routes there. 
What is the problem with that? Is that it? We can back it up then. Is it a problem with that? Yes? Uh, yep, yeah, one, two. Uh, that, that really is a problem with people that we can't dig inside them. With the magnetosome, you, you, you can slice up bacteria. You, you, know, the, you, you can look at their internals. Uh, no, nobody cares about, or even the animal rights people don't care, about, at least I don't think so, don't care much about bacteria. You, 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 so we don't really have a problem there of getting at the inside. Yeah? And even with people, you can form reasonable hypotheses as to which causal routes there are inside them to, you know, what, that's what they hear and what they see, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's another. Uh, okay, okay. Um, well, according to Gretschke, anyway, the problem is you could say this is just disjunctive. This is just representing something with an or in it. You guys have all done basic logic. Or? Okay, our old friend or, right? So it might, it might just be representing not F, uh, where the uh, oxygenated water is, but either S1 or S2, right? The problem was, how do you know it's representing this distal cause and not proximal causes? But it could be just representing a disjunction of proximal causes, either this proximal cause or that proximal cause. Yeah? OK. And here is where Dretschke wheels out his big idea. It's associate the possibility of associative learning that does it. Um, and that's very intuitive. Melissa was saying, a mere bacterium can't model us. Um, but maybe the problem with a mere bacterium is that it's not capable of associative learning. A thing, a thing like that can't learn. Um, but maybe the possibility is very intuitive that the possibility of learning has got something to do with being able to represent the world, with being able to have a mind. And associative learning is really a pervasive characteristic of animals. Um, a decapitated cockroach is capable of associative learning. I mean, it's, it's really pervasive. Yeah, it's, it's only very, very simple things like a bacterium that don't do associative learning. So we certainly do associative learning. And the way it works is, suppose that um, you have the system set up like this, and then there is another pathway that, uh, it's th that you, the, you start to find that, um, uh, let's suppose that uh, a particular kind of um, density in the water, suppose it's something that's sensitive to the density of the water, then suppose that fires just when this one's firing and when that one's firing. And then it learns that it can use the density of the water as uh, a guide to uh, where the oxygen-free uh, oxygen water is. Then if it's got that, you could say, well, now it's either S1 or S2 or S3. But it can't be just that, because it could learn a further route. So so long as it's always got the possibility of further learning, you're not going to be able to uh, say, well, it's just a disjunction that it's representing, because it's always got the capacity to add on another disjunct. At any one time, there are only going to be finitely many proximal things that we'll use as its guide. But over time, it keeps learning new connections. And over time, the only thing that's stable is that it's responding to the external Fness, the Fness out there that all these different things are guides to. So if you're capable of learning any new number of, any number of new ways of detecting Fness, that's what makes it the case that you're detecting F rather than anything else. So that's really pleasing. It was intuitive anyway that representing has got something, the ability to represent having a mind has got something to do with the possibility of learning. And this gives you a reasonably crisp reason why that would be true. Because if you don't have this capacity for associative learning, there's going to be no saying what you're representing. But once you do have the capacity for learning, then we're, in a, then we're able to um, say just which external properties you're representing. 
to be representing if rather than representing anything else, you've got to be capable of learning any number of new ways of detecting ifness. But if you are capable of learning any number of new ways of detecting ifness, then you are representing ifness. There you go. And now we've got a quite general theory of representation that will apply to the way we use language, uh, and it will apply to the way that um, cockroaches represent the presence of food. <coughs> I'm not sensing this. <laughs> I'm not sensing the triumph, the mood of triumph and elation that this should be <laughs> greeted with. But um, yes. How it helps? Yeah, so like, I have a number of ways of detecting if you start in my environment. Yes. I can recognize it by smell, or I can recognize it by sight. Uh-huh. Uh, but then there's the problem, maybe I'm <coughs> representing, how do you know it's just how I'm representing and not the disjunction of everything? Oh, the smell and the sight, smell yeah. Right? Yeah. And what's supposed to help is that I can learn a new way of detecting if you start. That's right. That's right. What pizza boxes sound like when you pop them on your table. Or yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but then it seems, don't you just have a free way disjunction? At any one time, you only have a finite number of proximal causes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's right. Um, uh, but since you've also got the possibility of learning a fourth way, saying all I'm doing is learning uh, is representing. Uh, the disjunct of those three things couldn't be right because you're going to keep that structure stable and it has the possibility of taking on board those new ways of detecting the presence of the external thing. If I were to decide that there could be a fourth way or a third way mm -hmm. that I could learn to represent pizza, you have to be assuming that I'm representing pizza, which is, which was, the problem was that we weren't sure how we were picking out pizza rather than... Yeah, but, it, yeah. Um, I, I guess... At a certain point, the, the appeal to function is going to come back in. Um, that uh, suppose that um, um, suppose that uh, I sound a. I see this is. Uh, suppose that I got bell. A bell. Uh, what does a bell look like? No. <laughs> Let's call that bell, right? And a light, right? That's a light. Okay. And they represent the presence of pizza. <laughs> they indicate the presence of pizza, right? Um, so now when I sound the bell, um, I, uh, I use that as an indicator for pizza. When I switch on the light, that's an indicator of the presence of pizza. And I have the capacity to add a new thing, right? Um, a particular tone or something. There you go. There's a tone, right? Um, and now one hypothesis is I've got a structure here that's responding to this, and its function is to detect bells or lights. And now there's been an arbitrary change in that structure. It's now become a structure for representing um, bells or lights or tones. Yeah? Or you could say, this is a structure whose function the whole way through has been to pick up in pizza, and it's just learned a new way of picking up on it. Yeah? Um, I think when you look at... Uh, just when you look at the organism in a particular case, one, one description will be much more plausible than the other. Yeah? That it's just made an arbitrary change for no particular reason, or that it's learnt something once you take into, into account the function. Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't want to back on functions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think you can go from that Can you? I mean, if that's the reason it exists, I mean, if the, if, if the, um, well, let me, it, let me make yeah. Oh, so, well, good, yeah, yeah. If you have a bunch of rabbits and randomly one of them is born that's pink, yeah. and it mates with a bunch of other rabbits and forms a bunch of pink rabbits, and I go through and start picking out the pink ones. Yeah. You kill all the ones that are here. Yeah. You, exactly. you brute. <laughs> yes, right. This <laughs> would be the reason why they're alive. Very good. Yeah. That's not like the function of the pink. That's just a random. 
excellent example. But look, the, the, the whole point about that example is that, uh, well, it depends how you, it depends how you work the example. Just as you gave the example, the pink, it, you, it, it, keeping them alive isn't the reason the pinkness was there. Yeah? But if you systematically breed the rabbits generation after generation, yeah, and do this, uh, kill all the non-pink ones, then ultimately you can say, look, the, um, the reason it's pink is to keep it alive. The function of the pinkness in this environment is that the predators kill all the non-pink ones. That's why they're pink. Yeah? I mean, it, it, after a few generations, right, after, let's say, a million years of you doing this, right, um, you can say there's a reason why they're all pink. They have that protective coloration. I mean, when, I, when you say animals have the coloration they do to blend in with their backgrounds, yeah, it's because if they don't blend in, they'll be killed. Yeah? That's the function of it is camouflage. Yeah, okay, so, so you, someone raised this last time, yeah. Um, I agree that when people are talking about the selfish gene or whatever, yeah. Um, the really puzzling thing, though, is that um, when people say, well, I don't mean there's a function in the sense that this is what someone wanted it to have. Um, and remember Dretzky's distinction between assigned functions and natural functions, yeah. What your biology professor is going to insist is that these are not assigned functions. Yeah. Now the question is, does that mean it's illegitimate to talk about functions at all? Um, how could it be wrong? How could it be just a mistake to say the function of the heart is to pump blood? This is what it does in the system. Okay, I, I don't want to, this is a difficult dispute. Um, and I think I do understand the line of reaction that says, well, you can talk about function if you like, but really the only kind of function you can make sense of is a signed function. Bleach out the assigned functions, and there is no notion of function left. All you have is a set of causal responses. Yeah. Um, I guess the intuitive thing on the other side is this structure, this biological structure, does the organism some good. Um, and that's not, I mean, you know, keeps it alive or keeps it healthy or something. Yeah. yeah? Um, and the furthermore, the reason it's there in the first place is that it does the organism some good. Then it's so intuitive to talk about function. Yeah? Now that might be a mistake, but it's not obviously a mistake. You're not obviously saying, oh, well, that's what it intended. Do you see what I mean? Okay, yeah. I see a little circularity there. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right, that's right. That's it, yeah. And I'm saying when you say that's its function, that's just another way of saying the same thing. Yes. Uh, yes, I see. Yeah, there may be a circle there, but I, I, I don't see that it's a bad circle. Uh, uh, I think it's probably a, it's a good circle. <laughs> yes? What's bothering me about this is that I feel like in order to deny brightness or aliveness, um, what you said earlier, like the function needs to come from some sort of intention. Uh -huh. The reason that it exists is not the same thing as the reason it hurts it. So you could look at why it hurts it uh -huh. and say, well, that's the function. But if you're going to call that function, then I wouldn't think you could deny brightness or wrongness from it because it doesn't exist. Okay. You can use it however you want. It's not right or wrong. Okay, this is the key. I, 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 this is another way of getting at that same basic worry. Look, I, I, I think this is perfectly reasonable. And um, I think when we look at Fodor, um, the whole point on, on Friday, the whole point of Fodor's approach is that he doesn't want to talk about functions. 
you think sort of functions are tainted in just the way that you guys are saying? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to. Sorry? Yes. If you're learning new representation, then it's wrong. Well, 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 you don't mean this kind of thing. Like you, you think you're representing pizza, but maybe you're actually not. Like, uh, no, wait a minute. You, you mean you think there is a pizza there, but there's not? Um, the whole way to represent, to have this technique, I think, how do you know that you're actually detecting it? Like, do you, do you know that you can detect pizza by seeing yes. it or by smelling it? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the idea is that yeah, the idea is that these proximal signals are associated with one another, and they're associated with one another sufficiently strongly that if after a training period you now get the new signal without the others, you'll still say, "Ah, yes, pizza." Yeah. Your mouth will water <laughs> just as before. <laughs> even, if it, even if it never works right, it still intuitively this function is to represent pizza. And so yeah. it seems like that's different maybe than something like this where you're saying, well, if it never works right, then it couldn't represent yeah. pizza. I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that just makes yeah. a difference between the kind of representation that we ultimately want to get to, like the represent kind of representation that we can do, and the kind of representation uh -huh. I actually think that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay, there are just two quick points I want to make. Uh, do you have time for just two quick points before we pack up? Um, suppose you think about color. Um, it, it seems like there's only one way you can find out about color. I mean, just by looking. There isn't any such thing. You, you, you know, with shape, there are lots of different ways you can find out about shape. Uh, feeling it, uh, uh, rolling it around, uh, that kind of thing. With color, it seems like the only way you have of finding out about color is by looking at it head on. But we only have, uh, so we don't have associative learning there. The only key way you have of learning about color is looking at the thing head on. But we do represent colors. We do think about colors, um, even though we can't find out about them in other ways than by looking. Um, so if Gretzky was right, there would be some kind of uh, indeterminacy about what we were uh, representing when we were representing color. Um, and I suppose Gretzky might say that's right. That when you're representing, when you're representing color, it's some physical structure out there. And it's really indeterminate what physical structure that is. Um, so there really is indeterminacy about what you're talking about when you talk about color. But I have to say, it doesn't seem like that. Surely you know exactly what has to be the case for an object to be red. You know, is, there isn't really any indeterminacy there. Uh, and one last um, quick point here. The standards of right and wrong for sentences are being explained in terms of biological function. Right? Now, I understand the wall of hostility that that is getting. Right? I, I, I see that. But suppose you just give Dretzky this about biological function for a second. Right? Suppose you think, say, there is it. That there is such a thing as a positive illusions. I mean, there's a whole branch of research in uh, psychology that says that uh, people, uh, it, it's often adaptive to think that you're more popular than you are, for example, or that you're more competent than you are. I mean, it used to be, I guess the classical view is that um, for psychological health, you need to perceive yourself accurately. And I guess the basic finding is that um, you, you study, you, you, you look at how popular people think they are, you look at how popular their friends think they are, and um, you actually need a mismatch there for the person to be happy and flourishing. You see what I mean? Um, uh, there are, uh, Shelley Taylor at UCLA has done quite a lot of work uh, on this. Um, positive illusions are just necessary for mental health. The adaptive function of things can be to let you get it wrong about yourself. 
So you can't equate truth with uh, serving a biological function. Because there's a, 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 there's a famous set of um, experiments where people were given a computer game to play and a joystick to work while they were playing it. Uh, and uh, the experimenters could vary how much control the player had over what was going on in the screen. And then they asked people at the end of it to estimate how much control you had over what was going on in the screen. So everyone exaggerated wildly, right? You, you know, you can imagine that. You, you, you're moving the joystick. You're, yes, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. You, you, you see what I mean? You feel that you've got much more control than you have. There was only one group that reliably got it right. They were dead on about how much control they had over what was going on in the screen. The depressives. Yeah, I mean, getting it wrong, exaggerating how much control you have over your environment, how well things are likely to go, how popular y you are. Um, these may be just be essential for psychological health. And on that bombshell, <laughs> we'll pack it up for today and look at for the next time. <laughs>